Okay, everyone, uh, welcome. Sorry, getting started a few minutes uh, late. Um, I have a, we have a great panel here for you today to talk about uh, driving ROI in OpenStack and how they did it, uh, especially from a startup standpoint. And we're also fortunate to have Martin here who can also give you, I think, some early perspective in how he sees it from HP. So let me quickly introduce the panel. We'll get, we'll get right into it. So uh, starting off is Joe Arnold, who's CEO uh, and founder at SwiftStack. Prior to that, spent some time at Cloud Scaling and at Engine Yard. Next to him is Jim Morris Rowe, who's CEO at Piston Cloud. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, Senior VP GM at Zimbra um, uh, before getting uh, acquired by VMware. And then last but not least is uh, Martin Mikos, uh, who was CEO founder at Eucalyptus, uh, was recently sold to uh, HP and is now Senior VP and GM of Cloud and all things Cloud at HP. Um, prior to that, uh, he had been founder at uh, MySQL that grew to be one of the biggest uh, uh, open source companies that you all are probably familiar with. So uh, with that, uh, just, you know, I think it'd probably be great to just jump right in. Um, what I thought I'd do first is have each of them, give, instead of talk about their companies, give maybe a couple of examples of some customers and how they drove uh, ROI and how they showed ROI in those customers. So maybe, I mean, Jim, maybe start with you. You've got, you know, some customers like... Candy Crush and you know King. I don't know what you can talk about. Zulily. Uh, what 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 can you tell the audience? How 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 you want? How how you show ROI? Yeah, sure. So um, I think it's becoming you know somewhat well known, certainly at conferences like this, that private cloud infrastructure done well uh, can uh, drive cost savings even versus Amazon. So uh, and, and there has to be a certain scale until you get there. It's not at you know 5,000 a month, but at, at 25, 50,000 a month, um, customers can start to see value if they um, build efficient in-house systems. And I, I think um, we, we certainly take some debate on that, but um, we've seen it at Candy Crush and at Zulily and at Chartboost, and, and these are you know six-figure, um, Amazon bills that have come down by 60% in some instances. And how, Jibtella, how, how did you convince them? They must have been skeptical at first. Yeah, you know? so, so how did, what, how did what I think Piston ultimately does well is we, we, we enable the, the private cloud deployment with minimal um, upfront costs. So, so we, don't, we, we have a piece of software that installs super quickly on commodity gear in a very scale out web, cent you know, web scale centric model, and it allows. Um, the the customer to see that it's not no ops, but it's fairly limited ops because if you have a huge professional services engagement, a big hardware buy, a, uh, a you know a, a four admins that you have to hire, to, you're, you're not going to realize those savings. And I, I think the way Piston uh, goes in quickly and easily in a POC fashion gives cu customers that comfort level. I think the other point is that. The one, you know, one of the best benefits of cloud I in the public sense is its linear scalability. It, it scales indefinitely, but the cost scales at that same pace. And that's, not, that's very difficult for, to do in-house. And, and I think the one um, you know, really unique advantage Piston has over some of the other OpenStack solutions is everything runs, uh, network compute, storage, uh, and the management plane all runs on every node. And you know, there's certainly challenges. With there, it's huge object stores are a challenge for us, and so we partner in those scenarios. But in general, for most of the the, the cloud's requirements, um, the costs will scale linear as well. So as you need, you start with 10 nodes. As you need more capacity, you add 11, 12, 13, 14, and you have this very kind of consistent cost curve. And, and I think those two um, kind of attributes, very hands-free system. Um, not no ops, but close to it, and, and this linear cost curve really helps us kind of drive so, that mindset. So, Joe, does it work the same way in storage well, as it does on the compute side? I mean, there's some slight differences there, right? And I, I, I echo this, this statement. It's really easy to figure out what the CapEx costs are going to be when you're doing your own private cloud. What's a lot harder to figure out is the operational expense. How many administrators are you going to be adding to your team or augmenting to your team to, to run that? And I think the goal on, on both of our fronts, or all, everyone here on the panel, is to really reduce that operational cost of running these larger scale clouds. Um, but from, particularly with storage from, from our point of view, there's, a, there's actually a bigger change going on, going from a, uh, a, a, a 
to a commodity-based open source storage environment. That's new for most people. And so, especially in that context, making it easy to consume storage in that way is, uh, is a big challenge. But once you realize that challenge and realize that it doesn't necessarily need to be a project that you need to take on, uh, that, that's where there gets a lot of benefit. So Martin, you've got a very interesting perspective here. Having sold to some degree against OpenStack and aware as a competitive framework with Eucalyptus, and having to convince customers to trust you on that. So maybe you can give us a little bit of insight from, from that point of view, but then you've also now got this insight being inside of HP. So can you compare and contrast? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you kind of think about that? First from a Eucalyptus and, and OpenStack same way now, now within HP. Yeah, I'll be happy to. First, if I may correct a little bit, I'm not the founder of Eucalyptus. I was not the founder of MySQL. I'm a hired gun. <laughs> I'm, my, I'm, I'm my, smart my, my, enough my. not to follow my own <laughs> ideas. <laughs> but, but anyhow, I think you could ask, why do we have to have a panel on ROI? Because it should be obvious. So if we have a panel and there's, the room is full, it means that we, we have some concern or question. And I think it has to do with the fact that the first benefit of cloud is agility. It's only later that we get into higher utilization and automation, which bring the, the financial, direct financial benefits. But early on, it's agility. And they say, what the heck is agility? But it is for companies the ability to move faster, to change plans faster, to do things in smaller increments and be much more responsive. And it means that the organization becomes more productive. Their R&D is faster, or they serve customers better. And then when we go back and say, so what was the R and, uh, ROI of the private cloud or a cloud in general? It's difficult to know because it's not exact dollars. So that's one problem. The other problem is that private cloud projects are messy. I know, I've seen two. Uh, and it means that as you are deploying your private cloud, you spend a lot of time just getting it going. And then at the end of the day, you must say, so what's the ROI if it takes this much work to get going? And then you have to rationalize it for yourself and say, oh, I'm learning, that's the thing. I'm developing my skills. And soon it will be so automated that we get the real benefits. And I think all of those are true. But that's why we are sitting here today not knowing what the ROI is because the real uh, benefit, first benefit and the reason to move to cloud is agility. The, the uh, straightforward financial benefit comes a little bit later. It's even agility when you go to AWS, if we use that as a as a, a contrasting point here. You don't go to AWS to save money, and you don't. You go to AWS to get more agility. You move much faster. And I, I know a customer where they make large telecom equipment and they used to test them four times a month. Then they built a private cloud and they started doing tests 4,000 times a month. And today they do about 4,000 tests per day, and most of them take less than 10 minutes to run. So they split the, the R&D function into such small pieces they can test everything all the time. How do you do ROI on that? How the, the result is faster R&D, higher quality sooner, and not necessarily a saving in the actual IT cost. And that's why I think we, we must ask ourselves, how do you do ROI, ROI calculations when you have to measure something that's very difficult to measure. So, so do you, when, when either at uh, Eucalyptus or I know the H HP is maybe newer or harder to talk about uh, since it's so new, how do, you, how do you sell agility? I mean, how, how do you go in and pitch agility to, to a customer, especially against maybe if they're looking at AWS, which is the ultimate in agility in a way? Uh, yes, that, that's a very qu good question. How do you sell agility? Well, first you say, I say only to those who know that it's agility they're seeking. <laughs> if they're not asking for agility, don't sell to them. It's because there's, there's more customers than we need today. So right. we, can, we can select those who really understand it. Um, and then why would you use something other than AWS? The thing is that there are uh, customers who need control. And that is the thing you sell to them. You say, get the agility that you get on the public cloud, but with the, your, under your own control. And, and at that point, they have to choose something that they can control. What, yeah, what other hooks? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, see it's a little, uh, I see it as agility, but there's a little bit of twist, at least from our point of view at SwissStack, uh, with storage. And we're seeing customers like in life sciences doing cancer research, um, a lot of video and video distribution. Um, and what they're being asked to do as operators inside their organizations is to 10x the 
amount of data that they're needing to store, but they're not getting any more headcount, they're not getting any more budget, and they're just having to figure it out. And so to them, it's, it's this deluge of projects that they're trying to take on, and this is a way for them, an alternative path for them to go down in order to get done and enable those projects that they weren't able to do before. Yeah, so I think this is a, it's a great um, uh, difference in um, kind of Martin's spot at HP and the resources that he can bring to bear for a customer uh, that has to understand their business problems and translate that into agility and translate that into private cloud or public cloud. As you know, as a small company, I don't have the benefit of, of that sales cycle, and 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 so we're you know agility spot on, and um, I think even more of an indicator for us is that the applications that our customers are, have created or are creating are cloud applications natively. So we're not helping people port their legacy workloads into, into a piston infrastructure. We're helping companies that have already built their stateless tiering and their, their, their redundant data structures uh, in the application, and, and we're helping them uh, achieve um, you know, this linear cost savings as they, as they scale out their application. And I agree, you know, agility is the key, and it's hard to quantify um, at that level, uh, it just, um, for my team, and, and certainly w when we talk to customers, if that agility light bulb hasn't come, come on, we, we run away. And, 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 and even more clear than that, if their application set isn't um, very clearly already uh, kind of cloud architected, we, we also run away. And, and so I think that slightly um, you know, puts us in, in kind of different engagements, but, um, I, but I think agility is yeah. key. I, mean, I think we kind of some some of the same perspectives coming from doing doing products around it. And who's heard of like the bus number, which is well, we used to use this in development parlance. Like, how many people on your team, if they got hit by a bus, would the project be totally like screwed? And and what what products do around an open source ecosystem is that it gives you a a, a vehicle to take on these projects, and it de-risks. Um, uh, taking on these private deployments for yourself. That means you have more organizational support, you have your, you, the project is on a different set of rails so you can get support throughout um, uh, the project. And I think that's, that, that helps also um, on return on investment um, uh, because you, you need less team members in order to get the same amount of functionality and, uh, and, and benefit out of the cloud that you're building. Uh, I'm going to save time at the end for questions, so everybody, please think of some questions. We'll make sure we'll, we'll, we'll make some time for it. Uh, just switching gears uh, a little bit, I, I, I imagine a lot of people in the audience are thinking about uh, how they build a case internally. You spend, uh, collectively, all three of you, spend a lot of time convincing customers that OpenStack makes sense in your respective solutions. What advice would you have for engineers, for people inside of companies that are champions, they want to do it, they're trying to convince the organization to do it, there's some resistance, or someone that really likes you know, VMware or whatever, what, what, what advice do you have for them? The first advi advice is to go for open source solutions, because then you have less lock-in. Not that you avoid lock-in completely, just have less of it, and, and you have more opportunities to choose among vendors and do things. So, so for most customers, that's the main choice. And then when they go into the OpenStack world, they can grab any of us. <laughs> I don't, I'm happy to recommend Piston and all the other companies in this space. That is the beauty of the ecosystem, that you can try out with any of them. And switching from one to the other, sure, it's a little bit of a headache, but not a huge headache. And you will have headaches anyhow, some headaches anyhow. So, so just picking up on that, a lot of people you know, they, they resist open source because they view it as just being difficult to deal with and a, a bag of bolts and internally it's just so much easier. I can just buy a solution and we talked about de-risking things. So how do, what advice, I mean, you've been in open source for a long time. Uh, what, you know, how, you know, if you've got an organization that's just resistant to some of the things, well, how, how do you help them get those, over that? Those who resist open source shouldn't use it. Let them overpay for proprietary <laughs> crappy software. <laughs> That's what you must let them do, and they lose in the market. Because if you, I, I mean it seriously. So it sounds like your advice to those engineers is leave that company. No, no, I mean it <laughs> not as a joke, because you must pick your battles carefully, and yeah. you must know where you can win. And if you try to go out evangelizing open source, then you're not, you need to sell your own product. The beauty of the open source 
movement is that it evangelizes itself. You don't have to sell that notion. But if there are some, still people who haven't understood it or don't agree with it, leave them. Because selling to them, that will destroy ROI both for them and for you. <laughs> so just leave them. Because there are so many, and I've seen this from my SQL days when, when open source really wasn't accepted. But now it is mandated by large corporations. And the fact that you in the OpenStack ecosystem, you have all the major IT vendors, IBM, Cisco, HP, Red Hat, and so on. And there are very few who are not there. So, so if you still face resistance to open source, then just leave those guys. You will never be able to sell to them. So leave your job or leave your job? Or change <laughs> your job or change your job type of thing? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, kind of more pragmatically, we use a lot of spreadsheets and help people through it. And we get asked that question by people who are in the seat of trying to convince uh, their management. And here we go. Here's what this looks like. Here's how to amortize the cost. Here's how, the op how many operations. So I mean, there's an exercise there that you can go through really to kind of pragmatically build it out. And let me tell you, it makes a ton of sense across the board, whether you're replaced. So in the storage base, so with SwiftStack, it's super easy f compared to uh, to storage appliances that you would buy, and and er everybody has lower than Amazon costs uh, when they're deploying with us privately as well. Yeah, so on the ROI uh, assistance, um, we very tactically we have a page on pistoncloud.com. It's a TCO calculator that allows you to put in your cloud requirements, storage, memory, um, uh, uh, compute capacity, and and then compare that to your Amazon bill. And it's a fully loaded uh, operational cost model, three year uh, amortization on the hardware, and you'll be able to see your direct monthly savings um, with a set of assumptions. Have some questions on how we built the model? It's fully loaded. Um, you know, pick up the phone and, and we can talk you through that. So that that's one help there. Back to Martin's point on on the broader open source technology. I think we in this room, certainly uh, in the community, ha have a particular uh, challenge with OpenStack in that it's a framework that really by itself does very little. Um, but with all of our assistance, it does so many different types of, of things from, from a use case standpoint. There's you know, obviously a tremendous amount of NFV um, uh, discussions here. There's this private cloud conversation that we're having for both enterprise workloads, uh, you know, web-centric workloads. There's um, the, you know, the VMware-oriented uh, you know, environments. And, and so we're particularly challenged in that we have to have some kind of uh, focus inside of this framework, and then we also, I think, are going to see this adoption pace continue to, for a little bit, kind of because of the complexity, lag behind some of these other things. I, mean, I bet when Martin was four years in at MySQL, you know, there were millions of downloads at that at that point, and that's because it was solving a very focused uh, problem. You know, we we put up Zimbra, and the first month we had 18,000 people trying a mail server, and you know, we don't have that pace yet because. <laughs> This framework is um, is so vast, and there's so many different use cases. And I think we'll see it. I'm already seeing it um, this year. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, a particular challenge, this piece of open source technology that we should be um, conscious of. Well, I think it's a little bit different, too, because of who is trying to adopt it. Like with uh, a developer tool or something like a database, it it's downloadable. It's consumable. You can run it on your laptop. But when you're building out cl a, a cloud environment, that, that's that's a set of operators. And what I think is so great about OpenStack as, as a movement, as momentum, is that it allows this generation of, of operators to learn about it and get trained up. And it, I think it's a very elevating thing for, uh, to, to bring on because it's, very, it's a very portable skill set from job to job. It's not like learning a proprietary technology and getting certified in that technology. Um, you, it's, I, I think that's a, a really neat thing about the OpenStack uh, as, a, as an organization because these so many companies can get involved. So, Martin, I'm interested in your perspective. Do you think that the, the case, the ROI, the, the justification for OpenStack, is it increasing? Are we kind of peaking? Does it just get does it get better over time, like a good wine? Uh, what, what what's kind of your 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 experience? You know, and looking back on your your history with with open source, it will definitely improve. It is improving, and it will keep improving. And one reason for that is automation. That we are building a very complex product, and we are not done yet with making it easy to use. It's complex for those who build it, and complex for those who use it. When it reaches maturity. It will be complex for those who build it and easy for those who use it. 
and that's when you will see the, the scalability in you can, where you can scale the cloud without scaling your organization and, and ROI will only improve. And I think also we will learn to, to reach higher densities of whatever it is, hardware density, software density, uh, using containers, we will have more efficiency if for certain workloads, not all of them. And we will learn to sort of pack more stuff into the same space. And, and that's why, you know, I used the al analogy of, of maybe, you know, containers are like mopeds and, and hypervisors are like cars in a big congested city. But we should look at the biggest cities of the world, Sao Paulo or Delhi or something, and see how the heck do they get so many people to move around so quickly every day. And, and it is by optimizing the system and using the same street area for multiple different purposes and sort of really maximizing the heck of it, which we have never learned to do in the, the Western world. You know, Los Angeles is heavily congested partly because every car is of the same massive size and there's nothing else. There are no buses practically and no mopeds and none of that. So it's, it's an analogy, but I do think it will apply to, to the OpenStack world that we we'll learn to optimize the heck out of it. And I think it will happen through vendors and we will specialize in our certain ways. And then you'll come to us because we make it very easy to consume and we've figured out a way that's suitable for your workloads. And of course, HP, we sell to very large enterprises who will do massive, massive things. So we optimize for them. And I guess Piston optimizes for a slightly different target market. Yeah, and it, it, I think we're like, so Swift Stack is in a little bit different position because we're just focused on OpenStack Swift and the object storage workload. And after working on the project for uh, several years at this point, we've now we've moved to more of that download model, um, particularly for testing and development. And now we're at a point where you can go to so SwiftStack.com, you can go create an account, download the software, and not really engage with a, a project manager to get up and running. And, I, and so I, th I think with this project, with Swift, with what we've done around SwiftStack, you're starting to see um, uh, what the maturity is going to start to look like um, coming from, from the ecosystem. So I, I'm looking forward to the stats that I hope you'll publish one day about how many petabytes are managed by Swift in the world and showing a curve growing. That's an awesome idea. Do you have that? Uh, we have the data. Yeah. So so just picking up, Marta, you mentioned you know about how uh, HP thinks about selling OpenStack versus maybe like Piston. Uh, if you just, you know just you know pros and cons. I mean, how how do you guys think about it? Where, where does Piston fit in terms of a ROI to a customer versus where does HP fit and where does it where does it overlap? Good question. <laughs> well, well, I can't speak for Piston, but I do know that at HP we serve very large enterprises. So they're giant IT operations and they do everything you can ever do with computing. They have uh, their own data centers, they outsource some and they use managed clouds and public clouds and we serve them across that whole range. So one of our uh, unique selling points at HP is completeness. If you need a private cloud, we got it. If you need a managed cloud, we got it. If you need a public cloud, we got it. If you need hardware, we got it. If you need services, you got it. Whatever you need, you, we have it. And we have it worldwide. We're already selling in every major region in the world. So, so and of course, large companies need that. And that's, that's where it's what we specialize in. Whereas I would assume that Piston takes a more a, a limited geographic scope and a limited scope on certain types of, of customers. Yeah, ma I imagine, Jim, you don't have people on every continent. Not yet. Not until I buy HP. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was Josh's joke. I, I kind of stole it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we, we obviously have to pick our battles. And, and um, I think it's, it's not just geographic battles. It's, it's also this, this light bulb that has gone on for the teams that we work with that uh, their application, the agility light bulb has gone on, the, the, the uh, architecture of their application has um, uh, been cloud uh, from day one, and they're looking at uh, either rapid growth of in-house infrastructure in a more efficient way, or looking at bringing uh, public cloud workloads back in-house without having to hire a, a huge staff of, of uh, sysadmins. And so it's that use case that we're kind of laser focused on. I think uh, Martin's point though, because I think at the end of the day, the underpinning technology is the same, and, and we completely agree that 
um, whether it's VMs or containers or, or um, bare metal big data instances, um, the, the infrastructure shouldn't really care and, and, and the customer shouldn't have to uh, do specialized um, work to get that particular workload onto their infrastructure. And so I think a lot of the technology challenges, even though the use cases are different, are, um, are very similar. How about Joe and storage with, with, with you competing? Uh, how, how do you think of that? What, what, what do you use at Swift Stack to differentiate? And, and you know, what, what's a better fit for, let's say, may, maybe an HP or, or, or maybe even a more traditional solution like, you know, from uh, EMC? Yeah, so, like, with HP, you're a customer. So that's easy, right? Uh, well, let me, let me back, back up a bit. We focus on a very specific use case, which is object storage for unstructured data. And that means we're... We're, we're, we're not taking on database workloads, we're not taking on virtual machine workloads, we're taking backups, archives, documents, media, and that's the work that we focus on, and that's all we do. And so when a use case comes up that is to take that on, we get, we get calls from other folks in the OpenStack ecosystem to help them uh, to take that on, because we're, we're so focused on that, on that use case. And I think where we, where we differentiate against other competitors, like with an, with an EMC, um, they're, they're, they're taking on those types of workloads, which are more traditional <coughs> workloads, which are still absolutely essential for applications. It's just as the scale in the data center gets bigger, as applications become larger and larger, and you have this trend towards software as a service, which means more users are using a, a, an application, and that's just growing in the data center, versus a each enterprise having their own version of Exchange Server in the closet, um, that's a situation where you can use general purpose storage. Uh, but when that Exchange Server in the, in the closet moves to Zimbra, or uh, metaphorically, then the scale becomes much larger and the storage requirements become more specialized, and that's where we come in. So let me pause. Any questions from the audience? We've got about, about 10, minutes, 10 minutes left. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. For, for legacy, yeah. yeah. I have a short tactical answer and then pass it on. Yeah, so, the, so very, very pragmatically what, what we've done is we've also realized that. So uh, Swift is an object API, and so what we've implemented is a file system gateway that speaks SIFS and NFS so that we can offload the type of storage which is optimized for unstructured data uh, into it, and we have, and so that that's a way that we, we help out with onboarding, and then the transition's important. Um, so what we've what we've executed is is you can put files in, and they get objects out. So that way, in you know 2019 or uh, whatever the time frame you're you spoke of, when you're ready to build those next applications, the objects are waiting for you, so they can be served out. So ta pra pragmatically, we've been thinking about that and, and have built that. Yeah. So um, first off, uh, you know our current um, go-to-market strategy is hopefully not our indefinite go-to-market strategy. It's a focus of a small company to solve, I think, the most pain that 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 is, exists in the market for the product. And 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 listen, uh, um, we didn't come to this 
uh, without talking to hundreds of enterprise customers like yourself. And the conclusion that we came to as a small company is that our architecture of web scale everything, hyper converged, you know, didn't, uh, the technology is ready for the enterprise, but the enterprise isn't ready for the technology, if that makes sense, right? There's too many antibodies around CCIE certifications and EMC relationships and uh, pre buys of hardware and, and, and VMware multi year contracts, and that um, the enterprise is just kind of not ready for web scale open. But Jerry, have you run, have you run, that's today, and uh, hopefully that changes. But, but if you run it, it sounds like it was more of a, how do I move my legacy applications? Yeah, but in the meantime, uh, how do you do that? Yeah. Then I would introduce you to my friend Martin Mikos because companies like his or even what VMware is doing, my old friends there, I think, are um, at this stage probably perfectly suited to spend lots of time with you. Thanks for the lead. <laughs> Thanks for the lead, Jim. <clears throat> That's very much what we do. And, and when HP decided a few years ago to become a leading vendor of cloud, they knew that it meant building fantastic cloud products, but also becoming experts on the transition from what we call the classical IT to the new style of IT. So that's why it is for HP a, a giant undertaking, because we are not just building products on top of OpenStack and Cloud Foundry and so on. We're also building a practice of transitioning, helping our customers transition from the old to the new and managing, you know, there are, there are many ways of dealing with, with legacy. Sometimes you just isolate it and manage it as such. Sometimes you isolate it and manage it with new tools, and sometimes you migrate it to the new environment and run it on top of the new environment. The good news with a cloud platform is that you can, of course, within an image and an instance you spin up, you can spin up any environment you like. So the underlying platform can be very modern, and you can spin up an instance that mimics an older world uh, environment with an older operating system and so on. So for us, it's a very high priority. So I'd be happy to have a discussion with I mean, I'd, American I'd, I'd, Airlines I'd, and others. I'd be interested to know, at American Airlines, do you still run mainframes? Probably a few. Uh, so okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But it's an excellent point, right? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, we still live in an age of mainframes. I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, it's interesting in, in, in history of, you know, compute, people rarely ever rewrite applications. It like never happens. So I think living with a, you know, a, a diverse IT environment is probably something that will be here. Uh, the stat, 99% of switch ports by 2019, is that a... Uh, friends at Gartner or who? who IDCs. IDCs. I, listen, I don't know if if we'll get there, but I would say if that happens, we've all collectively kind of failed you know, to some extent, right? Because um, I think the inevitable is that the big guys are on pace to do it more efficiently than we can, but um, but that shouldn't be the case. And and I think these Amazon savings that we're seeing today in real world environments are a great example. And I think if if IDCs right, then we've all kind of screwed up. Any other questions? Oh. Are you being taught by the same cloud vendors? I guess that you, you look to be hosting them, but are you hosting them as either boutique cloud, yeah. uh, middle scale uh, SEP type of open cloud, or the big people like Amazon uh, do a lot of cloud scale, or HP? Or SaaS uh, people. So it seems like it, their point was people are buying it, but buying it to build a cloud is just as much, or is that not someone who's buying it to build a good IT? Yeah. Right. Is that how this works out? Any other quick questions? In the audience? Well, let me, let me end on a question then for the panel. So, so from a startup perspective, or even from an HP perspective, what, what's the biggest myth about OpenStack today that you deal with in, in talking with customers? In terms of what, what, what they believe to be true and is, 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 not, is not the case, or, or what is the case and, and, and they just don't believe it. Well, specifically with storage, it's, it's how quickly they can get up and running and um, how Product companies have solved that, and uh, and I think that that's the there, there's this eye opening that happens when they they, they use a product that's uh, a more a little bit more refined that can glue together open source software and commodity hardware, and I think uh, that's a shock for people at, at this stage. Yeah, I, I think outside this conference, uh, the biggest myth is that OpenStack is not ready for production deployments, and and it's propagated by uh, you know some of our friends at VMware, and they're wrong. It is, and it is, and I think you know all of these use cases. Uh, number one, and then the one that I think we deal with the most is that the public cloud is cheaper, and it's it's not. If uh, if you do it wrong, it is. If you do it right, um, you can save a lot of money. 
What do you think, Martin? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> I agree with those, and I'm so new at my job, I haven't seen any other ones. <laughs> All right, well, with that, listen, thank you, everybody. Give our panel a big uh, round of applause. Thank you.